So, ladies and gentlemen, if we uh, start again, thanks very much indeed uh, for our first uh, panel. We heard from Jared just now about the Apollo 13 moment for the financial services sector, uh, the extraordinary recovery that we've seen in financial services, which is evidenced all around us uh, in the city of London, where we can see the cranes going up and new sky rises going up every day. Uh, the question, almost inevitably, is once again, is uh, financial services uh, the cuckoo in the nest uh, somehow, uh, or the, rather than the golden goose, uh, doing more harm than good by imbalancing the UK's economy? And we have an excellent uh, panel uh, to discuss uh, these, uh, these issues with us for the next 45 minutes, hour or so. Uh, first of all, on my uh, far left is Mark Hoban, uh, MP, MP for Ferrum. Uh, former uh, uh, MP, uh, sorry, a uh, former government minister, city minister, as well as minister in the DWP. Uh, to my uh, near left is Vicky Price, former head of the government uh, economic service uh, and now chief economic advisor for the Centre for Economics and Business Research. On my immediate right is Paul Worth, uh, partner at uh, Eversheds, and far right uh, is uh, Steve Hughes, who is the head of uh, economics at the Policy Exchange. So I'm going to start by asking uh, Mark if, if you would please to offer us a few uh, opening remarks. Sam, so, thank you very much, and thank you for having us here. Uh, today talk about rebalancing the economy. And I have to say that I believe that the financial services sector is a key part of the UK economy. Uh, and the financial services sector is a key part of the UK economy. I don't think you succeed as an economy by cutting down the size of your most successful and one of your largest sectors. What you need to do is to learn the lessons from the success of financial services and some of its failings too, to see how we can grow other sectors of the economy and to ensure that we use the strength of the financial services sector to secure growth in other, other parts of the economy. We will need financial services businesses, I think, to provide investment for the future, uh, to provide security to, to businesses, uh, through uh, insurance, uh, and to help manage risk. And actually, trying to cut the financial services sector down to size will actually impede, I think, in the long term, uh, the rebalancing the economy away from London and the South East uh, towards, the, the, towards the whole of the rest of the country. And also, uh, it would impede the, our ability, I think, to grow the manufacturing uh, sector. And it's worth just reflecting that uh, you know, we have seen uh, you know, over sort of a couple of decades quite a concentration of economic growth here in London and the South East. Between 97 and 2008, uh, London's share of the UK economy actually increased from 19% to 22%. We saw a reduction in the manufacturing sector from 19% of GDP to 11%. So there's some quite difficult challenges we are to redress, uh, to rebalance the economy both geographically and sectorally. But I think it is clearly a challenge we have to face. I don't think we should overlook the value of financial services to the regions. You know, the financial services and professional services sectors employ over 2 million people. Over half of those are actually outside of London and the South East. The largest private sector employer in Dorset is JP Morgan. If you go to any of our big uh, centres in the North, the Northwest, in Northern Ireland, actually you will see large investment banks having substantial operations there processing tra transactions. Their back and forth office functions are often based outside of London, creating employment opportunities. So what's the relevance of financial services to rebalancing the economy? I think we do need to learn some lessons of what happened in the financial crisis. There was, I think, a almost limitless supply of cheap bank debt to businesses and to households. I think a seemingly limitless appetite for that debt by those so businesses uh, and households. And clearly, when we saw the disruption of the banking sector, that choked off the ability of banks to lend, uh, that made bank debt as attractive. One of the challenges is actually how do you replace the uh, support that came from the financial services sector? Uh, and I do believe that one of our challenges is to broaden the base finance to ensure that businesses see investment not just coming from bank debt, but also from equity. And where they feel that uh, debt is a key part of their business finance, and not just bank debt, there are other sources of debt as well. Now, I don't think there's any great magic bullet that shifts businesses away from uh, bank debt to equity or to other sources of debt. Uh, you know, I think there's lots of interventions that we've made as a government to try to tackle that. Uh, but you know, you've still seen, you saw it last week when the uh, Bank of England published 
uh, its uh, quarterly lending figures, still a deep seated concern by business organisations about the lack of capacity of banks to lend. But things like the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, which, have, which encouraged uh, investment, equity investments in 1,600 uh, small businesses. One of the uh, successes of Project Merlin, there may have been many of them, but one of the successes was actually the Business Growth Fund. Uh, that's made 60 investments into uh, businesses, uh, providing businesses with a turnover up to 100 million pounds with development capital. That's been particularly effective. Then what we've also seen, uh, and it's part of the trend around disintermediation, around the use of uh, non-traditional sources of finance, uh, crowdsourcing, different forms of technology being used to get small businesses uh, off the ground. You know, it, it makes a relatively small contribution to funding for businesses, but I think increasingly they will play an important part uh, in helping businesses get off the ground and sourcing capital uh, for good ideas. I do think on the, on, on the, source, on the side of debt, uh, we are again seeing, I think, a much greater diversity of sources of debt for businesses away from the main high street banks. Uh, challenger banks like uh, Audemars, Shawbrook, uh, particularly, I think, great success story, but not much spoken about, is Handel's Banking. Uh, you know, I talk to businesses in my constituents who use them, great fans of what is a you know, very effective model of, of banking. Uh, again, we've got new technology coming in through uh, people like uh, Funding Circle. We also see, I think, different pro other providers coming in. So uh, interesting, the last week's stats around the funding for lending scheme, uh, one of the users of that scheme was Investco. Not normally seen as a, as a lender to businesses. Uh, we see energy with the fund that they've set up uh, to provide debt to, to, to businesses. So actually trying to diverse away, diversify away from a narrow source of funding for businesses, I think is very important in trying to get financial services itself to rebalance, but also provide the capital that businesses need to grow uh, in the future. I think this, the second area, just saying, and Gerald touched on it in his speech about, uh, about infrastructure, uh, we still haven't really, I think, cracked at the unlocking of long-term funds from insurance companies to support infrastructure. You know, and I think now that Solvency 2 is more or less been finalized, the changes now working through the uh, pension market, you know, with the appetite for higher returns from uh, consumers, there must be a way which we can work with insurers to find ways of unlocking that long-term capital that they have and putting it to use uh, in infrastructure assets where they're looking for uh, long-term uh, returns. Uh, and I think that's an area the government needs to do some more, uh, more sort of work on. And I think there's a growing appetite now from insurers uh, to engage in that market where perhaps in the past we've had uh, lip service. So I think there are some big challenges about uh, rebalancing. You know, I think we are reversing quite a long trend uh, away from manufacturing, away from exporting, away from investment uh, towards the southeast, towards consumption and towards services. But I think we are making some, uh, some progress in terms of uh, rebalancing. If you look at uh, the jobs figures, the region with the, the uh, highest growth rate in employment over the last year is the Northeast. And the region with the second highest growth, growth rate is actually the East Midlands. That's a sign, I think, of we're starting to see some growth in those regions outside of London, London and the Southeast, areas that have previously been neglected. We need to export more. Uh, the OBR's forecasts for trade this year uh, shows flatlining. And that's hugely dependent on what happens in the Eurozone. Our biggest trading partners are just the other side of the channel. And so the moves we're making to try to beef up uh, UKTI and improve investment finance uh, in export finance should help uh, promote uh, exports. But again, come back to my central point. We cannot do without financial services in helping us to rebalance the economy. We can't do without the capital, the insurance, the asset management services they provide to help us promote growth elsewhere in the country. What we can't make the mistake doing again is, accept, is expecting financial service itself to provide that growth. Thank you very much. I, I have to say that I agree with, um, with a lot of what's been said. Uh, I think it's worth, since the title of this particular session is about rebalancing the economy, to really think about what it means. Um, and can the government do anything about it? I think it's very difficult to imagine that sitting in Whitehall, one can really develop policies which will move the economy in a certain direction that we want it to be uh, moving towards. And I have to say that as a government advisor myself for quite some time, I have written quite a lot of industrial strategies in my time for uh, different uh, sectors of state. Uh, and of course we knew as analysts and advisors that there isn't an awful lot you can do, but we had to please our 
masters who occasionally want to be seen to be really intervening and really achieving some results by picking the odd winner where we knew at the end of the day would make very little difference and, and actually would probably distort the market. So we wished to write them in such a way that in the end meant they wouldn't do anything very much, which is of course exactly what we're accused of as civil servants, uh, but made them feel happier about themselves. Um, because in reality, <laughs> nothing much can really change unless there is something fundamental that can happen in a structured economy. And there isn't anything more fundamental, strangely enough, than something very, very simple that the markets can determine, which is the exchange rate. At periods when the exchange rate is really weak, manufacturing does well, we think, wow, we, perhaps we are becoming more of a manufacturing economy. Actually, we have remained a very substantial manufacturing economy, despite everything. We're still the sixth largest manufacturing country in the world, and we are, of course, also, if you, if you look at particular sectors like cars and so on, we're doing rather well. But there is no doubt that when the exchange rate goes up or down, uh, it does actually affect uh, the share of world exports that's uh, uh, taken up by, by the UK. Uh, but apart from that, it takes a very long time to really alter the shape of the economy. Even in manufacturing, if you wanted it to rise, uh, say, 12, 15, even 20% from where it is now, first of all, it takes a long, a long period of time, and second, the difference it would make to growth in the economy would actually not be that great. So the rest of the economy matters hugely. Services matter a lot, and the financial sector, of course, matters too. Now, of course, we don't want to overemphasize the financial sector's um, contribution to the economy, because, of course, a lot of the productivity improvement that we thought we were having during the, the year 2000s, um, in fact, was not correct. Uh, and was obscured by the interesting things that the financial sector was doing, which never really <coughs> added much to the economy. But if we're assuming now that rebalancing cannot happen through some people from the, from the center, um, it can happen through the normal, better functioning of the market, where funding can go to the right places, where there is huge productive growth in the future. And that's why we entitled what Mark was saying, that the financial sector has an incredibly crucial role uh, to play here. What can it do? Um, it can choose, or seek and choose, if it can, the growth sectors itself, uh, the ones where we see what happens in the world economy and therefore support for that is needed. Assuming, of course, it's allowed to take the risks, and that's the really interesting point. Uh, for me and for lots of others who have actually looked at the connection between the state and the financial sector itself, risk sharing has to happen. The, the government can have a role in taking up some of the, the concerns that the private sector would have in terms of funding, particularly innovation and new technologies, whether it's in green or elsewhere. And that this government is doing up to a point, but the amount of money that's been put into this is very, very small. And if you look at what's been happening as a result of all, all this, particularly the crisis and the Eurozone not growing and so on, in terms of investment, that dropped, of course, about 20% during the uh, private investment during the crisis. It's been going up recently, but innovation still remains a very small part of what is going on in this economy. So the financial sector needs to uh, move into the market to uh, achieve the, the, the right results and fund the growth that is, that is happening. But which way can it do it? Uh, of course, big firms can borrow wherever they want. So we mustn't forget where they want from. Um, the, the big corporates are able to tap the international market and, in fact, pay very little interest rate, given particular where interest rates are now. They are the ones that really benefit from the low interest rate environment, not the smaller firms. A lot of the emphasis of government uh, policy has been in encouraging SMEs to, to grow and their funding going in, in their direction. The funding for lending, for example, the scheme that was already mentioned, which was started in 2012, which was providing um, funds for banks which were constrained otherwise in terms of their liquidity and capital position <coughs> at quite low interest rates um, meant that uh, quite a lot of that in fact was disappearing the way it was administered <coughs> into buying shares and other things that that, uh, that banks were doing and also uh, lending to um, individuals for buying houses basically it was a mortgage replacement therapy as far as one could see. That has now been changed about a year ago, the rules changed, and now it's all diverting towards SMEs. That's very, very good news, so that is leading us somewhere. Despite the fact, of course, that SME lending is still declining, at least there is more emphasis in terms of it going in that direction. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot else, which is what the government is doing right now with a, a British um, uh, business bank, 
uh, where it's put together all the lending um, facilities that existed in lots of schemes, and now it's beginning to share the risk in terms of venture capital and so on in these areas. But overall, those other areas are not that big in terms of the money that's available. Look, for example, also at what is going on in terms of encouraging innovation. These catapults, which have all been set up, which is a great way of encouraging greater innovation in the UK, which have resulted in various centers going on around the country, which look at particular areas, whether it's renewable offshore, renewable energy, or whether it's computing, or whether it's clever infrastructure plans and transport and so on, um, and uh, high um, tech manufacturing. In reality, they're not getting a huge amount of funding. It's all coming from what the Technology Strategy Board has been doing for quite some time, now renamed Innovate UK, I think. They'll keep changing the names. And which is encouraging uh, lots of firms to come together and think of innovative ideas. But the amount of money that is available is likely to exceed about one a billion, perhaps, um, over a couple of years. And the whole hope is that the private sector will come and, and put more money into this. So the small, the quite tiny relation to what the economy needs, and to put it into perspective, uh, adding also what's going on regionally with the, with the local enterprise partnerships, which have got no funding for the moment, but are about to start getting two billion a year, a bit like what the RDAs that were abolished what you used to get. Uh, if you put that into perspective, overall lending to businesses is currently at around 250 billion pounds. Well, we're talking here about a handful of billions which are not really going to change the way uh, the, the, uh, the economy is shaped up. So rebalancing just will not happen, we might as well forget this, from any push from the center as I said at the beginning. What one really has to rely on is that the banks are run in such a way from here on, they can actually focus on those that are hopefully going to do something to get our economy moving, despite all the constraints they have in terms of capital, uh, recapitalization, deleveraging, and everything else which is being forced on them uh, from all sorts of different directions. And I'm afraid my conclusion is we're in such a schizophrenic environment as far as the financial sector goes that there isn't a huge amount of hope that what I would like to see happen to the UK economy will happen as far as the financial sector is supporting growth is concerned. <coughs> I noticed that there is nobody from financial <coughs> services on the panel, um, no banker on the panel, and as a uh, financial services and banking lawyer, I'm probably the closest you're going to get, so please uh, go easy on me. Um, I agree with Mark and Vicky that there is a, a very clear role for financial services in the, in the future of the UK economy. Um, when I was researching this this piece, because as a lawyer I don't normally get into it, economics too often, um, I read an interesting quote from Peter Mandelson who said that we want less financial engineering and more real engineering, which is a great soundbite, but I'm not sure it adds a, a huge amount uh, to, to the debate. Um, a couple of, of stats um, about the, the scale of the um, financial services and professional services uh, economy and, and its position in the UK. And these to me, they were, they were touched on by our keynote speaker, but these to me are the starting point uh, in, in confirming uh, that this is a part of the economy that needs to be uh, invested in. Um, two million people working in the sector, which is about 7% of the working population in the UK, but delivering 65 billion pounds of tax revenue, which is about 12% of the total tax revenue. So in our own businesses, if we've got a team um, that was uh, delivering 7% of, of the headcount, but, but giving us 12% of the um, revenue, we'd be saying um, that's not something we ought to be looking to shut down or close down or stifle. Uh, it's, it's an area that we ought to be looking to encourage. Um, it is blindingly obvious to say that the interests of other parts of the economy are intrinsically linked to the financial services sector, all businesses need different forms of financial products to succeed, be it vanilla, overdraft, working capital, uh, invoice discounting, factoring for SMEs, uh, to some of the more exotic products, uh, interest rate protection products, or, or, or exchange products, or derivatives and, and commodity risk uh, uh, products at the, at the top end of the market. All businesses need those things um, just, just, just to operate, never mind uh, to, to grow and expand. Um, but the sector does need to innovate, and it does need to um, 
look to do things differently. And, and obviously, the, the sector has had bad press of late. And I'll, I'll come back to the bad press, which I guess is the elephant in the room. Um, but a couple of examples of projects that, that we've been involved with recently, where I think the, the financial services sector can be proud of, of, of what it's done, uh, and, and, and whether it's boosting um, the economy has a social and economic advantage, advantage for the wider UK. I know there are people in the room from the Association of British Insurers, I didn't realize that when I wrote this piece, but um, the, ABI, the ABI and, and uh, the government, Treasury, uh, and ourselves, a number of other advisors have been working very, very closely together on a flood reinsurance uh, project. Many parts of the UK, as we know, um, would struggle or may struggle in the open market to, to be able to purchase flood insurance um, at affordable rates. The industry, the insurance industry, recognised that as an issue. Uh, the government recognises that as an issue. Uh, and the imaginatively uh, entitled reinsurer Flood Re uh, is on, on the uh, edge of coming into existence, which, which will be a, an industry-backed scheme and ultimately a, a government-backed scheme if necessary to allow all parts of, of the UK, be it the Somerset levels or wherever, to benefit from affordable uh, insurance with the knowledge that they can reinsure that risk. And that to me is, is innovative and it is different and it has an economic and social benefit. Um, second example, uh, legal in general as, as asset, uh, with, with huge amounts of money to invest in, in property. Ordinarily, um, asset managers would invest in commercial property buildings like this, buildings that you can see around them. They were very keen to invest in social housing. There were a number of regulatory uh, obstacles to that, but they, they, they worked hard with, with their advisors and recently invested £250 million in, in a social housing scheme which will generate 7,000 um, uh, affordable homes over the next seven years, which then has a knock-on effect, in, in directly a linear effect into the, the construction industry. So they are a, a couple of examples of, of the sector uh, innovating and, and, and delivering wider benefits, it seems to me. Uh, I too looked at geographic rebalancing. I also know the answer to, the, uh, to our, our favourite pub quiz question about the largest private sector employer in Dorset. We all now know it's JP Morgan. Um, <laughs> But I, I, this is something that I'm noticing on the ground, which is that the demand for, for services outside of London uh, growth beyond the city, growth beyond um, the, the, the square mile and, and Canary Wharf is, is tangible. And partly it's to do with cost cutting. But um, Deutsche Bank, uh, who, who we think of in, 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 uh, as an investment bank, in fact, uh, pr primarily in this country, uh, are relocating or, or, or employing 3,000 people in, in Birmingham. And, and that's not outsourcing of cheap back office uh, function. Uh, that is proper work that has previously been done in the city, wholesale markets work. Uh, to the extent that they uh, have approached, I would imagine, most of the law firms in, in Birmingham and said, um, please put us in touch with all of your derivatives specialists in, in the Midlands. Um, there aren't any derivative specialist lawyers in the Midlands because there's never previously been a demand. In 10 years' time, I'm sure there will be, or five years' time. Um, but the world is changing, and there is uh, scope for growth in, in London, but I think there will be continued regional growth, both in terms of financial services uh, and, and the professional <coughs> services that support that. And there's a whole, there's a whole um, lexicon uh, around um, the various options for, for decentralization. We've all heard of offshoring, which was popular a number of years ago. We now have uh, nearshoring and northshoring, which was a new one on me. But it's basically services being delivered out of Belfast or Newcastle or wherever it might be. Um, and as I say, it isn't confined um, to, the, to the cheap back office uh, uh, and enablement roles. It, it's, 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 it's much wider than that. Um, I suppose my final, my final point is, is around the elephant in the room. It's around what you might call cultural and ethical rebalancing, rebalancing within the financial services sector itself. Um, PPI and mortgage mis-selling to retail customers, interest rate hedging product mis-selling uh, to, to SMEs, manipulation of LIBOR and foreign exchange rates, compromising the integrity of capital markets are not things that the sector is proud of. Um, they're all issues that are at various stages of being unraveled and, and put right. Um, probably an exchange has probably got the furthest to go and, and doubtless there will be further high value 
uh, enforcement actions and fines levied by the UK and, and US regulators. I'm not trying, I will not try to suggest uh, that uh, all of that is fixed, uh, but the sector takes, or, or I sense that the sector is taking its responsibilities in this area extremely seriously. They recognize that to grow and develop um, and, and win the trust and confidence of, of UK consumers, but also of the, of the wider global markets, that, that we need to get our, our house in order. Um, there, ha there has been a bit of a law of unintended consequences um, around PPI mis-selling. There's a great quote from um, the chief executive of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders who said that the PPI mis-selling scandals are more for retail car sales than, than anything in the last 10 years, um, which, which I'm not suggesting is a model for uh, economic growth, you know, cop things up and then put things right. Um, but but the, the amounts that were being paid out as, as PPI compensation were, uh, in his words, um, not enough for a deposit on a house, but enough for a deposit on a car. I work with financial institutions day in, day out, and um, I sense and feel that not just the banks, but, but the wider community is, is trying to put its house in order. Um, a couple of tangible examples of that, HSBC globally has increased its compliance function from 2,000 people to 5,000 people, uh, which is an enormous uh, increase. Um, and that's something that we're seeing quite widely across, across financial institutions where there may be a, a freeze on, on headcount and, and recruitment in a number of areas, but, but certainly not in uh, regulation and compliance. Um, the consumer credit sector has moved across from OFT regulation to regulation by the FCA uh, in, in recent months and uh, is finding that a much tougher regulatory environment as one might expect and um, the majority of that sector uh, is, is taking steps to basically readdress its business models because the way it was operating previously, particularly at, at the grotty end of the payday lending community, was not, was not acceptable and, and doesn't work going forward. So that part of the market is, is sorting itself out. Um, and the, the ever-increasing level of the fines that are being levied by the regulators in the sense even if there were those people who were reluctant to make the change voluntarily almost almost forces the point there was a study out last week that was picked up in a number of the um, a number of uh, articles and, and newspapers that said by the end of this year um, it's expected that the total fines levied on western banks since the start of the financial crisis will reach 200 billion, and that therefore legal risk uh, is becoming a bigger issue for the banks than credit risk, uh, and that the problem with the legal risk is that it's unpredictable. Uh, and some of you will have read in the business page of the Times today that Neil Woodford um, has pulled out of one of the uh, banks his, his uh, funds investment in one of the banks on the basis that he perceives uh, that to, to be, there to be a legal uh, and regulatory risk around uh, that particular bank. <coughs> which for the record I personally disagree with, but that's by the by. That's why he's an asset manager, I'm a partner in the law firm, I guess. Um, and, I, and maybe perhaps the final example for anybody who's been into um, one church or place, head office at, at Barclays um, of, of late, uh, or receive an email from Barclays which champions their five new corporate values, uh, respect, integrity, service, excellence, and stewardship. Um, I work with that back but very often and you walk into the reception and these um, five values are writ large in five foot high glass perspex lettering on plinths around the, um, around the atrium and you think, blimey, they're taking this seriously. <laughs> you then pass through reception and go into the lifts and the lift doors close and another you know, respect or integrity pops up in front of you in four foot high lettering this time. Um, now, it would be very easy to say that that's, that's glib and superficial and, and it's easy to do that, and, but actually making cultural change happen uh, is, is more difficult. And I agree with that, we all accept that. What I'm saying to you, I suppose, on behalf of the industry is that I believe, from my dealings with the industry on a daily basis, that people realise those changes have to be made and that, that cultural rebalancing needs to happen. Uh, it will take time, but it's a journey that I think most of the banks are on. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
A lot of the rebalancing topics have been covered already by uh, my fellow panelists, but I'll, I'll take uh, expand a bit more on a few of them. Because rebalancing ultimately means different things to different people. And whichever angle you look at it from, there are big public policy questions that the government needs to answer. The first one that I choose is consumption versus saving. So consumption-led growth has often been defined as a bad way or bad model for economic growth and we need to switch to better savings culture over the last kind of three decades. The savings ratio has gradually declined. Uh, this government and the previous government have made good strides in trying to address this issue by bringing forward the raising of the state pension age or introducing auto-enrolment uh, in the workplace for people who earn a certain amount as well. I mean, I think the question really about that is whether we could go further. Some of the modelling the policy exchange did last year suggested that even at the contribution rate of auto-enrolment, it potentially should be high, higher, and also that the uh, auto-enrolment should be compulsory as well. And it's only that way that we actually achieve uh, a real shift uh, to saving so people are saving them for their retirements in the long term. The second thing was imports to exports. Again, it's been mentioned a couple of times uh, by the panelists. But one of the biggest problems with, import, uh, with exporting more, or certainly exporting more to the emerging economies of the East, or Brazil, or Mexico, or any of these other places, is the fact that there are significant barriers to UK companies exporting to these destinations. So over 50% of our exports do go to the EU, but that's quite natural given the single market, given uh, language, given uh, business culture, um, everything else associated with it. The problem with businesses trying to find export destinations further afield is that um, there are language barriers, there's cultural barriers, there's not a tr trusted agent within those uh, countries. What can the government do about this? Well, we've heard that it's, uh, that it's uh, added to export support organisations, which is fundamentally a good thing because pre prior to that, our export support network uh, was in, uh, paled in comparison to our competitive countries and it needed to be expanded, and that was putting us at a competitive disadvantage. Um, the next element of rebalancing would be services to manufacturing. One issue I always have with this, having formerly worked for a business representative organisation, is that manufacturing, as my dad or granddad would define it, doesn't necessarily exist in the UK anymore, and there's a lot more grey area between manufacturing and services firms. Rolls-Royce is the classic example that builds its engines, but also makes an enormous amount of its money through servicing um, its parts and, and products as well. Um, and the other point to make about manufacturing is, yes, it's been in decline relative to the financial services sector, but it has actually increased in my, uh, contributes, uh, just looking at this on its own. Now, the government, again, has tried in certain ways to uh, add fill into the industry, but probably the biggest example, the most expensive example, would be investment allowances and increasing those for plant machinery, uh, which would hopefully help uh, that industry in uh, more the fourth area which hasn't necessarily been talked about is the rebalancing from the public sector to the private sector. Since the coalition came to power, the amount of government employees there are has fallen. We've had a deficit reduction strategy which hasn't necessarily gone to plan, and that's still going on. It'll be interesting to see what happens post 2015, depending on who gets in, given the fact that we still have a problem with public finances, we still have a mass massive hole there, and there needs to be big tax and spending decisions. That will affect the economy, and it will affect the path that the UK takes uh, as well. The other point to make about that is the low-hanging fruit of spending reductions has already really been taken, so things like switching the operating uh, welfare benefits between RPI and CPI, uh, or removing child benefit, for example, from higher earners, they don't they aren't options open to them anymore and spending <coughs> reductions or tax increases are going to be a lot more politically charged um, in the coming parliament. Uh, the final one is obviously the regional one as well. Uh, the regional question where we have net contributors to the exchequer of London, South East and East of England and uh, those who take more off the exchequer than they do provide to it would be in the rest of the UK. I always think that this is and Gerard touched on this, was the 
biggest questions around developing those places outside London and the South East is infrastructure issues. The government has a limited pot of money to spend on infrastructure and it has to make a decision between investing, say, a couple of hundred million in bridges over the Thames, where arguably the economic benefit would be greater, or developing what could be an A road in the north between two competing towns. Almost always, if you're looking at an economic analysis, the benefit of infrastructure in the London would be greater, but there are other considerations, obviously, to factor in as well to this, but they're hard choices that the government's got to make in a time of uh, fiscal restraint. Um, just to, I, I mean, I think these guys have covered the financial services angle and how important it is to, to all of those factors already. I mean, I think the one thing which I'd leave with an open question on this is the cultural element of financial services. Financial services is this umbrella term for all different types of businesses, uh, which I think are often tarred in public perception or potentially even in the media. Um, with the banking brush, and uh, obviously that's not necessarily the case. I do wonder if it'll have an impact almost naturally on rebalancing, if, say, for example, high, high level top graduates start going into other sectors of the economy rather than the financial services um, because of, um, of the reputational damage that has been suffered uh, since 2008. And that's why we're Thanks very much, Steve. Um, so let me kick things off. Um, Mark, if I could start with you. Um, one of the issues that Vicky picked up was this question about uh, financing, especially to small and medium-sized uh, businesses, and referred to the funding for lending scheme, which, uh, as she referred to, was originally was a more a mortgage replacement scheme. It's been rejigged, but the, the most recent numbers we saw um, suggest that SME lending via the FLS is still not going anywhere. It's still declining. Uh, until we see more growth in SME financing from the banks, it's going to be quite a hard case to make, isn't it? The, the case in favour of banks actually helping rebalancing to other parts of the economy rather than serving their own ends. Well, I think, Sam, that um, a couple of things I'd, I'd make. First of all, as we pointed out, the, the, the shift in the FLS away from more just to SME funding, I think it's quite an important one. Uh, and it's, don't, you know, don't forget, at the time that uh, the, the mortgage element was in there, uh, mortgage rates are starting to rise. Uh, people are finding, particularly with uh, high loan to value ratios, finding it quite difficult to get a, a, an affordable mortgage. So there were issues around the function of the housing market, uh, which required the FLS for good housing as well as uh, business lending. I, th I think one of the challenges, because we, and we don't know this because it's the, um, it's the sort of counterfactual, you know, is what would have happened at the time to bank lending if FLS hadn't been in place. You know, what would have happened to rates? What would have happened to availability? Uh, and so I think you need to bear that, that in mind. You know, there, there is a, both a supply issue and a demand issue. You know, are banks positioned to lend? And crucially, do businesses want to invest? Uh, do they need bank lending to uh, invest? If you look at uh, you know, the growth of commercial paper over the course of the last uh, few, uh, few quarters, uh, if you look at uh, the balances on, on campus balance sheets, that's the thing I saw in the, 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 the weekend, you know, 620 billion pounds sitting on corporate balance sheets. You know, so it may well be the case that businesses who want to invest have the resources or find alternatives to banks. Uh, and you know, we shouldn't judge the success of financial services, just how much money they're lending to businesses, because they've tried to do that before. End well. But the fact that we're having now a competition in markets authority examination of the sector again yeah. um, suggests that there may well be something rotten in, in Denmark. I mean, there may well be a structural problem in the banking sector, which means it's not serving the wider purposes of the economy. It's not competitive now. I mean, these other sources of finance are actually quite small fry in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And we should, you know, we should get them out of perspective. I uh, looked at some figures today that showed that uh, RBS had reduced their lending to SMEs by about 18 billion, but peer to peer lending had raised about, lent about 300 million. So the perspective, it's important to get the perspective right. Um, you know, I, I think there is an issue around competition, and certainly some of the, the barriers to entry for new banks it is a problem. Uh, and you know, I think one of the things, I remember sitting around a table with, uh, with Vince and Fizz uh, talking to some of the challenger banks. And one of the issues that hadn't really surfaced until that meeting was actually was access to the payment system. If you're a new bank, you had to access the payment system through uh, one of your larger competitors. 
you know, adding time to the cleaning of checks. So there's some sort of, there are some barriers there. So it may not be the banks themselves, but it may be some of the infrastructure around it. Uh, it may be uh, the, the way in which the regulators uh, look at banking application. Now the PRA have said they've upped their game on that. It's still quite a, quite a challenge, though, to get that get those new entrants in the market. Well, one of the, well, Vicky, one of the things that uh, smaller banks do complain about is that uh, the capital rules are incredibly punitive uh, for, for new entrants. Uh, Absolutely. The regulation is really skewed in favour of big incumbent banks which have their own internal models where they can kind of, in a sense, tilt the scales in their own favour. Uh, what sort of barriers do you think need to be stripped away? I think that's absolutely true, um, but of course what we've seen is there's already some uh, change in the way in which uh, newcomers are, are looked at by the regulators. There is already a suggestion that the fact that the requirements should be uh, easier for them. And uh, one of the examples um, that one we have been looking at, certainly, and I remember when I was at this as well, uh, is what goes on in the US, where quite a lot of small banks that are targeting their lending to SMEs uh, are exempt from all sorts of requirements that the bigger banks are not. Of course, you still have to watch it because obviously you may need to go in and rescue them, and the risk is still very great in terms of SMEs. But nevertheless, they are encouraged to to set up in a way that the, the, the system around them allows for their continued existence at a considerably low cost that would otherwise be the case if they had to meet all the capital requirements that were there. So, so I think there is a of interfering with, with the rest as you know. <laughs> um, so so I think I think there is a recognition that the, the requirements should be eased in the areas where uh, they can be eased. I mean obviously you don't have an incredibly insecure system around. Uh, but nevertheless I think there is there is certainly a move to look at this in a lot more favorably. Otherwise you just won't get the competition. Now the question nevertheless is uh, why are we so um, stuck up on having even more competition in, in, in the sector? I mean, uh, as we just heard, what those challenger banks would do is, is relatively small in the overall realm of things. Uh, in many other countries, the result of, we've seen it here too, of course, the result of the financial crisis was that the banks consolidated, and the way in which they survive in the future, provide the adequate finances required, is through merging. So I think we need to, at some point, accept that we're not going to get more competition. But what we need to do is have a system which actually functions with interest in the economy rather than otherwise, rather than just worrying constantly about who is allowed to come in and go out and, and, and so on, which I think is very political in my view, rather than being based on, on I think, we'll see what the, what the CMA does, on, 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 on proper competition, economic competition issues. Can we talk about these regulatory barriers then, um, in terms of uh, the, the ones that Vicky was just referring to? Uh, are there regulatory barriers which do need to be stripped away in order to uh, allow a greater diversity of uh, financial, financial services? Uh, and what sort of thing, uh, changes could actually make a real difference? I actually don't think we should lighten the regulatory framework, whether for new entrants, whether for foreign banks or, or for existing banks. Capital adequacy is difficult. Um, there was certainly discussion that some of the um, banks from the East looking to set up in London should be allowed a, a lower regulatory compliance threshold or threshold in relation to certain aspects of, of regulation, uh, which met with, with much um, commentary, uh, heated, heated debate. Uh, my own sense, and, and, and this is from dealings with the FCA and the PRA, is that um, be, it, be it new entrants, be it those who are coming under FCA regulation like the consumer credit um, uh, industry, be it uh, foreign banks looking to set up in London or, or foreign banks with an existing London branch, the regulatory view at the moment is that the bar should be set at the same level. Uh, and there is a, a regulatory tool, uh, which some of you will have heard of, called a Section 166 a review. Some of you may have had the misfortune of having gone through a Section 166 review. Um, and for our sins, we're one of the firms that undertake Section 166 reviews alongside some of the accountants and compliance consultants. And it, there appears to be a theme um, 
within certain parts of the PRA and the FCA, which is, which is specifically targeting that issue. Um, not so much new entrants, but, but lots of focus on overseas banks, um, you know, not, not, the, not the big boys uh, that they will always get themselves into trouble and have to go through due process, but there's, there's a real focus on making sure that, that the smaller institutions, the new entrants to the market, that the foreign banks are playing the game by the same rules and that that's a cost of doing business in London. And I'd be reluctant to suggest or to endorse a view that um, a more relaxed regulatory environment was appropriate. Can I just uh, say that uh, I think what people are talking about is not that you really don't, don't regulate them as much, it's that the initial capital may be required to start, to start your business it might actually be less than, than uh, what was originally expected. I just think there's no interference with that. Oh, fine. Okay, so we'll move just one mic. Was that the initial capital that may be required for a, a new entrant may actually not be as high as might have been expected uh, if there had been, you know, um, sort of around and doing multi varied business around? Because actually they're going to be a much simpler business, <laughs> generally. Uh, and therefore, perhaps the, the capital they require need not be that great. So, and that's so as simple so as that, rather right. than anything terribly, uh, you know, Complicated, which might sort of affect the standing of the city of London and the UK as a yes. Uh, Steve, can I ask you to give your thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll give my I'll give my thoughts. Um, the point about SME finance, uh, given by Mr. Arbitrary, uh, on behalf of SMEs with the banks during the financial crisis. Um, at the time, I'm mean, quite glad, glad I'm able to say this now, I mean, one of the problems always was, was that a lot of SMEs simply weren't finance ready. And a lot of the rhetoric and narrative in the press around SME access to finance was not really an accurate picture. There was an issue with supply, obviously there was, but there was also an issue with demand from SMEs, both in terms of them not wanting the finance because they too scared to have the confidence to invest or, or use finance, but also because they were living in a different world and they hadn't adapted to that different world yet. And getting SMEs finance ready, ensuring they have a proper cash flow forecast, all the basics um, were, was something that was obviously lacking from a, a portion of the SME community, some of which that had been in operation for 16, 17 years, never experienced a negative quarter of economic growth. And the other thing that I'd add to that in terms of the balancing debate of, say, the creation of the British Business Bank, I think it's a very good initiative. And people always hold up Germany as having um, the, the model for doing this. But the German system was built up over the course um, of like 50, 60, 70 years. This isn't going to be a kind of panacea for all the problems with SME finance uh, within the UK. And it's going to require a lot, both the supply side and the demand side, to get even near uh, solving of that problem. I'm going to take some uh, questions from the floor, but before I do, just uh, Mark, could I ask you for your thoughts on the on the, the business bank and whether that that has been slightly oversold in terms of its uh, capacity to help this rebalancing and help uh, SME financing. I mean, I think one of the challenges that that I saw at the Treasury was we we came forward with a plethora of schemes. Uh, to help uh, lending. And each scheme by itself was good, had a certain particular purpose. But I think actually the, the number of schemes created confusion. And so actually trying to bring them together I think is important. I, I think it's also uh, interesting, I think uh, Vicky touched on this in her opening remarks, uh, about the use of guarantees, about, about you know, government back guarantees. And certainly I, I talked to um, a, minister, a treasury minister in the previous government who was rather envious of our ability to use guarantees. Uh, and it was a tool that they, they felt was off limits uh, to them. I think it does actually help across a range of areas be able to buy guarantees. I think the Business Bank at the moment uh, is looking at uh, guarantees for lending to SMEs uh, in some shape or form. Uh, uh, but uh, I think we need to, and I think it's very wise to counsel in a very yes ministerial sort of way that kept civil service kept ministers happy. I think we do need, I think, from time to time, be, to be realistic about what we can achieve and the pace of what we can achieve. Uh, because actually so much is down to markets, to people's sentiment, to the, the fundamental economy, and governments, I think, can tweak the tiller 
uh, I don't think we've turned the attack around on the six foot. Okay. Um, could I ask for questions from the floor? We already have a couple. Um, oh, many. Right. Okay. So we'll take maybe three and uh, and then uh, move on to another set. So first three, uh, gentlemen towards the front um, in the glasses. Next, next to you. Uh, Howard goes there. Well, uh, of course, it's not just banks that are subject to cap capital adequacy rules. Uh, there's a huge ball of money uh, sitting in the institutions, the insurance institutions. Um, and um, they're subject to very similar rules. Um, there has been a comment, which I think is probably correct, about government guarantees. I mean, many of these institutions require rated debt if they get to the end. Um, and of course, no SME, or very few SMEs, were going to get any sort of rating at all. And if they don't get a rating, then the classification from the, from the lender's point of view um, is going to, you know, is going to suck up more and more of its, of its, of its, of its uh, principal capital. Um, and um, I think the other problem that uh, these institutions have is portfolio theory, uh, and that is that the managers are sitting there uh, looking at a diversification of assets, um, and um, at all times considering, uh, you know, where's the best place for their money to go. So without some form of government guarantee, it doesn't seem we're going to get anywhere, particularly with the private sector, in terms of diversification and uh, moving the funds into further across into the industrial and SME sector. Thanks very much. Uh, another question here, right here towards the front, please. Second row. Thank you. Uh, Alex Worry from University College London. Uh, I think we may be talking about the treatment of some symptoms when the problem actually is industrial practice in some cases. Uh, I myself have done some work with peers looking at payment practices in construction, just as one example, not, not as a big one, the problem always. But the case in construction is that SMEs, as, as I'm sure many people know, finance the activities of contractors, and that is uh, that's the problem that the, the contractors rely on these SMEs' uh, cash flows to finance their activity, should the government try not to deal with that as the root cause? <coughs> and one more. Um, so, sorry, just fell to the back, I guess. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, George Crozier from the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Um, there's a, a vote in a couple of weeks' time which will have a bit of an impact on the rebalancing of the UK. Um, obviously, if the answer is if the vote is yes, it will have a big impact. But even if it's no, there will be quite a lot of powers that will probably be devolved to Scotland in the event of being a vote. And now they're the sorry, sorry, could you? Uh, we can't quite. Sorry, agree. you want me to still talk into the mic? I'll, I'll have a go. Yeah, it's sorry. It's rather loudly. I know. I'm no worry. Um, I was going to say, whether the vote is if vote is yes, clearly in the Scottish referendum, then there'll be. Um, a huge impact. But even if votes know there's a lot of pressure for devolution of powers to Scotland, uh, pressure in the wake of that to Wales and Northern Ireland, and pressure for powers to go to more sort of cities and regions of England as well. I was wondering if there were any particular powers that the panel thought should be devolved from London to try and encourage um, nations and regions of the UK. Yeah, thanks very much. Right, um, so. Uh, let's start with Howard's, Howard's question about uh, about the institutional money, which is being locked up effectively and may need uh, some government guarantees to to unlock it. Uh, this this calls to mind, certainly for me, also the issue, the whole question about uh, unlocking securitisation for securitisation markets, which has been a big uh, point of debate in the ECB and the Bank of England. But Vicky, let me ask you to start on that, and then also Mark, if you comment as well on that on that particular issue, because it's extremely current at the moment. <coughs> Um, absolutely, and as we know, securitization is, is sort of discussed as if it's come, likely to be coming back into fashion and acceptable, uh, even though it was supposed to have caused quite a lot of the problems of the past. Um, but it just shows that we do need that money somehow. Uh, the question is, where should it go? Um, I mean, of course, SME lending is inherently dangerous. There is no doubt about that. And there's still a question as to whether we should be focusing so much on SMEs rather than on other things, uh, such as infrastructure spending or... Um, or government investment itself, which will then encourage all the other uh, companies uh, which, sub which were subcontracting to, uh, to do better and then the banks perhaps to improve the, the risk um, 
appetite as well um, as a result of this. So, so uh, it is really a, a serious issue, and I, I would think that whatever government guarantees there might be, which will be, uh, have to be limited up to a point. Um, there probably are better places to put one's money. Well, I, I was intrigued, Sam, to see the articles over the summer about the securitization markets coming back. I think I remember uh, those articles being written in previous uh, summers as well. And I know that uh, when I was at the Treasury, uh, we, we tried a couple of times to work with the bank and then, and then FSA uh, to look at securitization and what can we do to bring it back. You know, and you know, I think there's a, there's a should be a product there. I think it is challenging. Uh, I'm not quite sure where the... Um, CRD for energy bond securitization, uh, but you know I think that you know, there is an opportunity there, as how said, to to use securitization to, to tap into money in the insurance sector, uh, and you know, with uh, solvency two being resolved, that should be a more straightforward process. Thinking more products they want, what they might wish to buy, but I think it still, it still is a challenge to get a securitized bond either for SME or for mortgage markets these days. Thanks. Uh, Steve, can I ask you to pick up the second question from Alex uh, on payment practices? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, payment practices, again, um, this is a, a supply and demand issue. So uh, I remember a time when the government was launching, this was the previous government, was launching its prompt payment and uh, trying to get businesses to sign up to basic principles about how it would pay its suppliers. And, Indeed, one of them was in the room, one former government minister, when she refused to let 3,100 companies leave the room until they signed up to this code. But one of the problems that these companies always put forward uh, for prompt uh, payment, and indeed the stories around payment as well, was again around kind of invoicing correctly uh, and everything associated with that on the business side as well, that they could actually do it. So it wasn't a black and white picture as always, but I do agree with the problem that um, extending payment terms up to like 60 days, 70 days, 90 days even in some cases, does create significant cash flow issues for SMEs, particularly when they don't have access to the facilities that they would normally have access to. But unfortunately, we simply don't know what the answer to that is necessarily, unless you mandate it. And I think we think the European Union, there is a, a directive in the European Union that does mandate um, uh, payment within a certain amount of days, but there's just not many people that are aware of it. And of course, there is the page job problem of a supplier not being willing to uh, to challenge the company that they are supplying for fear of losing the business. Okay, thanks very much. Um, finally, uh, Scotland, it's taken us a while to get around to this issue today, <laughs> but it, it uh, was inevitable. I think everyone saw the polls this morning. Um, let me throw it straight to Mark again, uh, <laughs> for which he will not thank me. What powers do you think should be uh, devolved? Uh, what, I suppose, in a sense, what message does this send about the need for further devolution from the centre, uh, from Westminster, and what powers should be devolved, uh, not only to Scotland, if indeed it stays within the Union, but also to other parts of the UK? I mean, so, you know, clearly, the, uh, in the event of a no vote, then I think all three main parties have said that uh, income tax will be devolved to Scotland, uh, and you know I think that will actually present quite a challenge. So it's quite an economic business challenge, I have to say, to one side, but then it also does create much more accountability in Scotland for uh, debates around public spending, uh, and, less, and there's, there has been an absence of that debate uh, in Scotland since uh, devolution. I, I think accountability is quite an important point, and I think it's the point I talk about the connection with devolution to cities and regions, uh, that we haven't really found a mechanism yet, I think, for ensuring that uh, local authorities or in city regions or in uh, metropolitan boroughs are accountable for economic growth in their area. Uh, and you, know, you talk to uh, businesses that want to grow and expand, I've talked to a hotel chain that wanted to uh, build a uh, hotel in Camden. Uh, actually, there was simply no interest at all in Camden Borough Council, Council allowing that hotel chain to build a, a hotel. A hotel that would actually employ hundreds of people, would employ take people off uh, the employment queues. There was no incentive. And I think trying to find a, a way in which we can reward and penalise uh, areas that uh, take responsibility for economic growth <laughs> would be something I'd actually like to see across the country. Uh, 
Well, I think the, the general rule is that, um, or at least that's what uh, even some of the government thinks at times, is that people on the ground do understand what's going on better than you do in Whitehall. And I think some of the regional policies of the past seem to um, follow down that route. But the truth, of course, is that quite a lot of what happens locally um, can be just as misguided as something that may happen with some central sort of direction. Um, Find your local authority with a good economic uh, department, and then I'll give you a prize um, if you do. Of the regional development agencies, there was only one, any sort of semblance of having proper economic analysis being done. And quite often, you pass the money across thinking that they're going to be, it's going to be spent in a certain way. We had a very you know, interesting tasking framework for local authorities before, RDA before. Um, and of course, we knew that it just wouldn't happen. Um, and a lot of waste happens as a result of, of this. Uh, so what, how do you strike the balance? I mean, the things that really can work better is if the, the, the areas, including cities, particularly if they work together in a region, can uh, sort out transport problems. That's really important. The way in which they can actually look at their training needs and education. I think that is important. Housing, that is important. Those are the three areas, I think, which are the most useful ones where local expertise really can make a big difference in terms of how the money is spent. Um, I think those are also the areas where I think centrally we fail the most. Uh, I think there needs to be a balancing from that point of view. Paul. Um, uh, just a housekeeping point. I appreciate the crackling. I'm not going to answer that question because I can't add anything to what has been said. Uh, I apologize for the call. It's the sound. Um, I've checked whether it can be improved. And it's not feedback on microphones, it's because the frequency we're transmitting on has been sold to 4G phones and it's being ripped out next Thursday. <laughs> I suspect we didn't tell Policy Exchange when they booked the room. Um, but the only practical suggestion is before we come back in for the next session, if, any, if we could actually turn the phones off, it may improve marginally as opposed to having them on mute. I do apologise for that. <laughs> okay, that definitely wasn't an answer on the referendum. <laughs> um, I'm picking up that you don't want to answer that one, do you? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, Steve. Uh, so, so, what was the question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, okay. So I think I think the genu genuinely is uh, it depends it depends on what what's evolving. I mean. I'm interested in the idea of fiscal devolution and what that could actually mean for um, uh, certain regions of the UK and whether it could make them more competitive. I'm interested in the ideas of, say, things around, such as the enterprise zones initiatives that were popular, um, not only in the 80s, but in the, in the response to the financial crisis. Um, I think some of that devolution now is hindered uh, by European Union what we can and can't do uh, in giving tax breaks and things like that to companies uh, in, in certain parts of the country. Um, other than that, I mean, I think there's a lot and a big and strong case for devolution of welfare services, and I think that is one area of government policy whereby knowledge of local labour market conditions and nuances and idiosyncrasies of them can really help in trying to find those people who are um, the long term unemployed get back into jobs because I think that's where local economic partnerships and everything else, which I probably agree, I'm not necessarily sure I would trust them with masses and masses of money, but I would trust them to try and uh, engage between the public and private sectors to try and get uh, the hardest to help back into work. That's a, actually, let me just pick that one up very briefly. That's quite an interesting point, isn't it? I, I mean, I remember the government did have a city strategy at, at one point um, with lots of local mayors <coughs> and that sort of thing, I think was the idea. It didn't go very far, or at least it didn't go very far in a lot of cities. Uh, what, what could be done to re-energize that, uh, that whole agenda, Mark? Yeah, I, mean, I think the thing about local democracy is you want people to want it. And if they don't want it, then they, can't, they don't have it. Yeah. And yeah, we try and referenda for local mayors and it you know, singularly failed to set the nation alight. Um, so there's a challenge there, but I, I think on the welfare point, and it's an interesting debate, and it's, I found when I was at DWP clashing swords every so often with the local government association who wanted more money uh, to support getting people into work. Uh, what was, they seemed rather less enthusiastic about, though, was wanting to uh, pay their job seats allowance. 
and I went to visit the Netherlands where they had their responsibility for uh, unemployment benefits and getting people into work rests with municipalities. Yeah, and if they got unemployment down, they made a windfall gain. If unemployment rose, then there's a cost to their taxpayers. They were remarkably focused on getting people into work. <laughs> remarkably focused. Yeah, and I think there's a the thing here about accountability. You know, we are giving quite significant sums of money to uh, local enterprise partnerships. I, my experience from my part of the country is actually they do a better job than the RDAs. Um, but you know, there, there needs to be a mechanism there of accountability. Uh, and I think incentives uh, are quite important. And I think there has been a culture in when we do bidding for uh, local enterprise partnerships that those who are good and deliver actually do get a bigger slice of the cake than those who are just merely, merely average or, or, or poor. They don't win out so much in the bidding wars. Yeah, just uh, uh, one small point really about the welfare issues. I think it was very interesting uh, what you mentioned. Um, of course, I think policy exchange has already put something out, if I understand correctly, which says that uh, because money goes further in some areas, uh, what people get, the employment benefit and everything else, should actually be the wealth of payment, should be adjusted by this. So, of course, the same idea as paying public, ser public servants differently in different parts of the country, which, of course, is going to lead to all sorts of uh, complications. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that, uh, if you then add up all the other benefits as well, be interesting to see what it does in terms of completely, you know, well, encouraging people to move around perhaps a bit more, I don't know, whether mobility actually is helped or, or, or not. And of course, there are loads of quite poor areas where what may happen is that um, they're seen given further, possibly, uh, if, uh, if their payments are, are, are cut more. I mean, the, the, the unintended consequences are quite significant, and I don't think anyone has really worked them out yet. But in principle, there isn't any, in, from an economic point of view, any real reason why. Uh, whatever happens on welfare and employment benefits and also payment uh, shouldn't be following the, the realities and conditions of, of the area they're, they're within. But what it does in terms of mixed mobility, uh, inequality and so on across the UK, it's really quite hard to, to, to imagine. Right, thanks very much. Uh, that brings this panel session to a close. Um, we now have a coffee break for about a quarter of an hour, during which time I encourage you to turn off your mobile phones uh, so we can resume with a minimum of interference at half past uh, talking about the future of the city. Thanks very much.